today in space. In space. So, what is science? It's an ever-evolving framework of ideas that has been created to explain how the universe and the world around us work. Ideas are experimented, data is taken, and then those claims are tested in the Colosseum of scientific peer review. You see, it's not just good enough to have an idea, create a test, and find your results. If you want your hypothesis to become a part of the giant scientific framework, you need to allow that idea to be tested by others, especially those who think you're wrong. To begin, let's start with the first rung of the scientific ladder. It is the first step in the scientific method. We are talking about, of course, the hypothesis. It's the very start where scientists begin to attempt understanding the world in front of them. According to Britannica.com, the formulation and testing of a hypothesis is part of the scientific method the approach scientists use when attempting to understand and test ideas about natural phenomena. The generation of a hypothesis is frequently described as a creative process and is based on existing scientific knowledge, intuition, or experience. Now, how does one create a hypothesis? Everyone is capable of creating a credible hypothesis, regardless of how many astrophysics courses or books they've read before. In fact, some of the greatest hypotheses have come from a daydream or a burst of thought and inspiration. The major difference between an idea and a hypothesis is action. That action comes in the form of a test to see whether or not your idea holds water. In academia and research, creating a hypothesis is a little more complex. A literature review probably needs to be conducted before you can create a hypothesis. Now, b before your anxiety goes through the roof, a literature review is not like an IRS audit or even a test. All it means is that you need to do your homework. It involves researching your subject area and finding out what other people have found on the subject. From there, you create your hypothesis and find a test to get data and analyze if your hypothesis is right or wrong. So, in the simplest of terms, a hypothesis is an educated guess of how things in reality work. From there, you follow the scientific method on your way up the scientific ladder of ideas. Create a test for your hypothesis, analyze your data, draw conclusions, and then, if all worked out, you can share your idea with the world. If not, you go back to the drawing board and either redo the test, change the test, or, if needed, change the hypothesis. Now, before we move on, I do have some important notes to add. Number one, the test you create must be reproducible so that the experiment can be conducted again and again and again. This is really important because then others can try and see if you're wrong or if you're right. And number two, empirical data is king. Facts don't care about your feelings. It takes courage to challenge old thought or create new one. And so for your own sake, make sure you can gather unbiased data so that you know that your experiment really worked. Don't cheat yourself out of success by smudging or getting bad data. It's not worth it. The next rung of the scientific ladder is a theory. This is arguably the most used term of the three and a big reason why I did this episode in the first place. Somehow, the term theory as used in science is also used in the mainstream, but to discuss someone's strongly held idea. And that's not what a scientific theory is. And I would guess that most people's theories have never gone through the cheese grater of truth that is the scientific peer review process. I also don't think most people have ever had their ideas challenged, but we're getting sidetracked. So, according to MerriamWebster.com, a scientific theory is a plausible or scientifically acceptable general principle or body of principles offered to explain phenomena, not to be confused with the general use of the word theory, defined as an ideal or hypothetical set of facts, principles, or circumstances often used in the phrase in theory. You ever heard that one? Essentially, the difference between just a theory and a scientific theory is as follows. A scientific theory uses mathematics and science to explain a general framework of how something in reality works. A non-scientific theory can be simply a hypothesis, but without testing done on the theorizer's part. And there are various kinds of scientific theories, from newly tested to thoroughly tested and then everywhere in between. Scientific theories are frameworks, tools, and equations you can use to discern reality. The more a theory is tested and passed through the peer review process, the better that theory becomes. 
Which brings up a very important point. Not all scientific theories are equal in their metaphorical weight of knowledge and correctness. A good way to think of it is each scientific theory is an opinion, and the amount of times it has been tested and proved out or used to create another working theory gives it a certain amount of metaphorical weight. This means we can have theories with little to no ability to test, like string theory, which are fun, but they weigh very light on the scientific significance scale, where the theory of general relativity has been tested many times and has been used to create entire fields of science, including string theory, and weighs heavy on the scientific scale of theories. Now, in my opinion, this point seems to be missed by a lot of people, including the scientists and the science deniers. Science deniers will compare science theories like evolution and say, well, it's just a theory, which, as we discussed before, is the wrong scientific definition for it. It's also a different term. <laughs> On the other hand, many science-minded folks will get emotional about deny someone denying science. They'll attempt to defend science or go farther than a scientific theory has intellectual legs to travel, claiming that it's a law or that the one I hear most often is that there's no denying a theory like evolution. And this bothers me because it's not intellectually honest. And it's just an attempt to dig your heels into the ground and defend something you care about. Admirable, yes, but not productive or helpful. So the best thing for science is to explain what we know and be specific about the things we don't know. Actually defining what a theory is with help, lying about this, or overreaching will give deniers a reason to claim it's all bullshit, thus muddying the waters of honest intellectual discussion. Let the facts be facts, and let the brutally honest peer review process handle the tough work. All we have to do is communicating scientists, or just people passionate about science, which I think you are, is to share this new knowledge with others. My last thought on scientific theories. In my opinion, even a metaphorically science-heavy theory is not a perfect explanation of how the universe works. They seem to go over a lot of people's heads when things like evolution get brought up. Anyone who's gone through the gauntlet of a STEM education will know that even great theories don't explain everything when you apply it to the real world. That's why tests are still hard in school. <laughs> like, it's not a plug and play with numbers. It would be great, but it's not. Science only really gives us a way to describe, predict, and sometimes manipulate the world around us based on the limits of our physical universe. There is a tendency, however, to think that scientists know everything or that we have all the answers. I'm going to tell you that's not true. <laughs> in fact, scientists spend most of their time working and learning on new things, which never ends. Science is a tool that gives us a reproducible and accountable explanation for how things work, which seems to be mistaken with us knowing everything. The double-edged sword of science is that even when you've found a theory that encompasses how reality works, you open up the box of more questions that need answering. It's like cutting off the head of the hydra and two more take its place. This is a great thing if you're looking to spend your career searching for answers and learning about the universe. You'll have more to do than you'll ever fit into a lifetime, but if you're looking for the answer or a simple yes or no answer to life, science can't do that for you. The final rung of the scientific ladder is reserved for scientific law. Scientific laws are very similar to theories in science. They help us understand our physical reality in the universe and provide the boiled down simplified and distilled expression of what is. But there is a major difference. Scientific theories provide a framework of equations or an explanation for a phenomenon. Scientific laws explain in the simplest of terms what has been discovered after testing and observing the same thing over and over and over again. Simply put, scientific laws attempt to describe the fundamental nature of the universe. There's a catch though. Scientific laws are observed over and over again as long as the conditions for the observation and phenomena stay the same. If the conditions are not the same, or if they change slightly, you may not get the same results. Just as in life, there isn't one answer to rule them all. Instead, we have general rules, in this case scientific laws, that work all of the time, unless something changes. Some examples. Newton's Law of Gravity. 
only applied for weak gravitational fields and did not help explain how the universe works or really even explain what gravity was. Narrodynamics, love it. Bernoulli's principle is scientific law for all incompressible flow, things like air and water under normal conditions and speeds. But as soon as the flow changes, like breaking the sound barrier, for instance, going really fast, Bernoulli's principle fails because we are now dealing with fluids that are being compressed and thus dynamically changing how these gases flow and react, requiring a new set of rules to explain this compressible flow phenomena. In order for something to become scientific law, it must be tested for a very, very, very long time. Long enough that enough people have done the test so many times that it's seen as a literal expression of what is. Because it has been seen to do this virtually every time. For instance, water is liquid if it's experiencing one atmosphere of pressure and its temperature is between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius. If the pressure changes or the temperature is out of that range, water is no longer liquid. But it can also be liquid under different conditions. Basically, science is great, but life and the universe is complicated. Scientific theories and laws make it a bit easier to understand. And that does it for this episode of Today in Space. Thank you for joining me. I really do appreciate you taking the time. If you're interested in what else we do here at Today in Space, you can head over to our website at www.todayinspace.net, find us on YouTube on our page Today in Space, or listen to us on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. I am Alex Giorfano, science communicator, and until next time, spread love and spread science.